uh, yeah, I'd like to go through the process of creating a digital audio device from a high level perspective. I'll attempt to show most of the things you'll want to learn or skills that you want to look for if you're hiring. I'll split my talk up a little bit. Um, and then I want to talk about like electronics and bare metal programming and programming in general and a little bit on the output side of things as well. Uh, a little bit about me and why you should listen to me. I've been an embedded developer for over a decade in the audio industry. I've, um, I'm currently working freelance, but I started out a company called Kadak that make um, theatre mix mixing desks. Um, I, I worked mainly on control surfaces when I was there, but a little bit with audio as well. Uh, more recently, I've been working with Roly on products like the Seaworld Rise and the uh, the Lumi that you may have seen that's come out recently. Um, I'm also a musician. You should check out my band. It's a shameless plug for Nova Neon. Um, we're recording again in December, assuming there is a December. So that is exciting. I've done one or two other little talks before, but this is my first main one or major one, I would say. Um, this, I don't know if you can see this video, but if you can, then this is my crash synth talk that I did at ADC uh, 2018, I guess, I think it was. It was just a lightning talk. And it's all about a synthesizer I made, hardware synth, which um, it works by crashing, basically. And it modulates its output frequency by modulating how often it crashes. So if you look at this, screen grab if you can kind of see the little gaps in the bars of signal. That's when the system is in a crash state. I did a short talk for London C++ Meetup as well, uh, which was all about some of the challenges of writing embedded C++ code. Please don't attempt to parse this code yourself right now. Uh, the programmers amongst you might be trying to figure out what this does, but it's not for human consumption. This code was a snippet I used to make a point about how silly embedded code can be. Uh, it's my take on a Blinky program, which just flashes an LED on a development kit at one hertz, though this one does so with the CPU asleep. Before we begin, a quick note about jargon. There may be a fair amount of complete nonsense and phrases that make no sense unless you kind of know what I'm talking about, feel free to ask about that stuff. Um, there's also an extreme amount of acronyms, including some arguably time-saving multi-dimensional acronyms. If there's anything that you don't understand yet, just please ask. I will stop and uh, answer most of it if I can. Okay, a few years ago, I embarked on an ambitious little side project. I decided to spend some of my spare time building a tiny digital hardware synthesizer completely from scratch, from the ground up. Um, I'm sure you've all done something similar. I imagined that it would look something like a USB stick with uh, a headphone socket on it, basically. So you would plug this into a computer, um, send MIDI keyboard data to it, and maybe get audio back or audio out from the headphones, and with a couple of like volume controls on there. My design started with a microcontroller, and I added a digital audio converter with a headphone amp that was uh, built, built into it uh, for my output. So all in one little device. Seemed handy at the time. Then I added USB so that I could get the MIDI data, excuse me, from the host PC and possibly send audio back, uh, along with some basic volume controls uh, so that I didn't destroy my eardrums while testing so far. So good. Arguably, I should have stopped here. But no, I, I went off on a bit of a tangent and thought, well, what if my synth needs samples? Maybe it's a granular synth or, or something like that. Where would, where would I store the samples? So I, um, I added an SD card slot for storing samples and RAM memory expansion for interacting with them. So it's getting a little bit complicated now. I then set about creating an electronic schematic. Ignore this schematic, this is just something I found on the internet. And laying out a circuit board. 
soldering all the components. Again, this isn't my board. Unfortunately, I can't share the, the actual project with you, but I can share my workflow and some of the knowledge, uh, some of the knowledge you might need to do this for yourself if you wanted to. Again, this is a completely unrelated board. I have no idea what he's building. It looks like some sort of Wi-Fi device. Um, here's an example of uh, workflow. It isn't a full workflow. I've left out the fact that you'll probably do multiple revisions of everything and the fact that eventually you'll have to do it all again in order to get a product through manufacturing. But that's for an entirely different talk. You'll probably begin with a basic design or concept, uh, just figuring out what you want to make. Then some hardware and firmware prototyping. Here, rather than building something from scratch, save yourself some pain and use an already working development kit if you can, or put it together using Arduinos or Raspberry Pi. You can also prototype your firmware code using library code or code provided by component manufacturers. This code may or may not make it into your final product. That's up to you. Once you're happy with your prototype, you can get into your proper schematics and printed circuit board designs. You'll have a head start here as your prototype hardware will serve as a useful reference. Right, uh, concept. What kind of device should we build? Maybe we want an audio interface because perhaps we've located some niche, like tubes sticking out the top, or maybe there's just not enough audio interfaces around and we feel like we need more. We might have a microcontroller or a microprocessor at the heart, an analog to digital converter bringing audio in, a digital to analog converter sending audio back out, uh, a few physical controls, level controls, for example, along with a USB or some sort of interface to the host computer, sending and receiving audio or control data. Control data. It doesn't have to be USB. It could be uh, Bluetooth, PCMI, whatever. Uh, perhaps we want to make an effects pedal. A bit simpler this time around. We might have audio coming in via an analog filter into our processor via a converter maybe foot pedals for controls and a digital audio converter on the output side, sending the audio back out. Or maybe we just want to make a synth. A bunch of controls could be knobs, could be a touchscreen, whatever you want. The processor will generate our audio and send it out the DAC, the DAC um, in theory. I want to share a little bit about analog electronics, schematics, digital circuits. In my next section, I'm going to take a sip while you read my quote. First, what we call the analog domain. This is where our system begins and ends. We might start out by measuring the outside world. So um, I'm sure you're all familiar with um, microphones converting vibrations in the air into electrical signals, or we may have sensors reading electrical signals or temperature or whatever. Um, also, you, most of you probably use faders and parts to control your equipment, your gear at home or wherever you work. Input and output jacks to wire up your speakers, etc. All of this stuff is in the analog domain. The analog parts of the system comprise of arguably the most important parts. Our power supply keeps us ticking and efficiently, uh, so the efficiency and the noise of the power supply affects the whole system. Analog filters are our first line of defense against unwanted signals and side effects. It would be amiss of me not to mention how electronics are tested and issues diagnosed. One tool in the arsenal is your oscilloscope. Excuse me. Oscilloscopes allow you to directly probe your electronic circuit to inspect and analyze the actual signals. This is how you can figure out what's really happening on the circuit. Scopes are very expensive, so if you don't have the budget, you can probably hire one, or you can get USB scopes, which don't have a screen. They tend to be a lot cheaper if not quite as useful as the real thing. Um, other equipment such as audio signal analyzers, um, like Prism Sounds, D-Scope, or audio precision gear, those are industry standard, i.e. 
expensive pieces of equipment, which you'll likely just want to hire out if and when you need them, unless you've got limited budgets. Uh, we can't really go much further without looking at some schematics. So um, schematics are essentially a visual design language which can describe how our components are connected and give an idea of what they might do when they are. All the basic component, uh, components on a schematic have their own corresponding symbols. These are just a few of the most common ones. Uh, op amps are used in all sorts of stuff. Transistors make up pretty much everything, um, and you can't do much without resistors and capacitors. Integrated circuits or ICs are chips that contain their own circuits, usually complex circuits that you wouldn't want to lay out yourself. Um, and they're designed to do very specific jobs. Um, they're made up of all the components that we've just seen, plus whatever else is needed to do the job. This, for example, is a power supply IC that takes a 5-volt input and outputs a 3.3-volt signal instead. So um, it requires a few capacitors around it to function correctly. These capacitors, they're there to smooth out signals, filter out unwanted frequencies, essentially. The components themselves are connected by these lines, which just correspond to wires and connections that you'll need to make when you actually build the circuit. Don't worry too much about, about all, all the numbers and whatever here. Just um, trust me, five volts in, three volts out. You can kind of see that top left, top right. And this is useful, for example, for powering a microcontroller, which might be requiring 3.3 uh, 3 .3 volts whereas you might be getting your power from USB, which is five volts. To get started with schematics, you may want to familiarize yourself with EDA software. These tools allow you to design not just your circuit, but will take your, your circuit design and automate the process of creating the PCB. Um, it'll take a whole kind of Im internal image of everything you've done in your schematic, and it knows what to do to bring that over to the PCB side. Once you've completed your schematic design, each of the components will have like a physical footprint along with you know, the connections required and what they're connected to. Uh, your EDA tool will take these footprints and all this data and bring it over to the PCB design editor, allowing you to design a circuit board for your design. At this point, you need to you know, uh, design the shape of your board place all of your component footprints and connect everything up. This is a time lapse of the connections being laid out on a quite a complex multi-layer board. I'm not going to get into any details on this as that would be a whole nother talk. Um, but suffice it to say that all of the, you see a lot of wires here, all the wires that have like a different color from the wire exists on a different layer of the board. So you can see it's quite a few different layers. It's very complicated. This is presumably some sort of processor and memory being laid out. Don't worry too much about that. Um, if I was getting started, I would grab um, KiCad, which is like an open source PCB EDA program, and make use of tutorials and reference designs. Often dev kits come with designs and components themselves. Uh, may come with recommended circuits and PCB layouts. So if you were to grab um, a component or a dev kit, it's going to come with a lot of documentation. It's going to come a lot uh, with a bunch of examples and some of the things that, that will come um, along with it will be... Um, ah, I just got a question, sorry. That's really distracting. Here we go. I'm going to answer this one. Um, why KeyCAD rather than Eagle? Um, KiCad has uh, is very actively developed. Um, the folks over at um, CERN, I think, are, um, are part of um, its current development. And there's, a new, there's new features being added to it all the time. But what I really like about it, actually, is that it's extendable, uh, extensible. So you can, if you know a little bit of Python, you can automate a whole bunch of stuff that you're doing. It's also completely open source and completely free to use with no limitations. Whereas I think Eagle Community Edition, 
probably is totally fine for starting out with. Um, and yeah, there's probably a bunch of other um, examples of great tools to use. Um, I'm just sort of thinking about Keycare because there's a lot of really helpful YouTube videos for training and stuff. I'm not sure if I've mentioned that in my talk later on, but um, yeah, we'll see. I think it's done. There are always um, ways to verify your schematic and PCB designs. Uh, the EDA tools will likely be able to check that you've got everything connected up right, assuming that you've set everything up correctly. And the PCB side as well will be able to run all sorts of analysis on, on your work. Um, uh, you, but you may actually want to simulate parts of your circuit to be sure that given certain input signals, you'll get the correct result. Your EDA tool likely also has a simulator built in, but this is an online one which is fun to play around with. That you could just grab now. Um, here you can lay out simple circuit and look at the expected signals. Um, let's have a look. There was one thing I quite liked in here. There's a little buck boost converter. It's a really, really simple little circuit is showing how you might be able to get around 15 volts from a 5 volt input via this magic jiggly pokey. Don't worry too much about this kind of stuff. This is something to look into later and, and learn more about, but I love this stuff. You can see that the output 15 volts should really be a flat line and it would be if this capacitor was a higher value. Just bear in mind the real components are never as perfect as the simulations, which means um, they might not come out the results might not be quite the same as your simulated results, but it's really, really useful to simulate as much as you can to get a good idea of what's really going to happen when you put the whole thing together. Um, so uh, how do we turn continuous analog signals into discrete digital values? There are two common methods for analog to digital conversion. SAR converters are usually what you'd find on microcontrollers and uh, processors and they're well suited for reading sensors. Sigma delta converters are continuous frequency based algorithm. I won't get into too, into too much detail um, right now, but um, they are commonly used for audio. Audio ADCs, on top of using the sigma delta, they also have a few other tricks up their sleeves. They'll use filters because they're only really interested in audio frequency range. So they can filter everything else out. Noise shaping and dithering are kind of a black magic, I would say, that's used to improve conversion accuracy by adding noise back into the system. And um, there's really good reason why they do that. And I wish I could get into it, but that is extremely complicated. Um, yeah, ADC, they typically communicate their results to a microprocessor or microcontroller. They'll do this using signals following particular protocols, such as I2S or TDM, uh, which package the audio into a stream of digital signals that the processor will be able to decode. Control protocols are typical too, such as I2C, used for ICs to talk to each other. That's pretty general purpose. You'd find that on all sorts of systems, audio or not. This diagram here shows one of many implementations of TDM audio comms. TDM isn't standardized, so yours may look differently. Uh, don't worry about that too much. I2S, however, is probably more important, probably more prevalent. Uh, it's, this, this is the main way that ICs will communicate audio between each other. Here you have three signals. Sometimes you may see I2S with a fourth signal. That would be um, a master clock used for synchronization. So the same clock would be getting fed to your different parts of the system so they all stay in sync. When the serial clock on the top there um, signals uh, transitions from uh, low to high, the serial data signal is sampled. The word select signal effectively says which channel you're reading at the time either the left or right. Uh, I2S is only stereo, though there are alternative versions of it that aren't quite standard, um, which have more channels. Otherwise, you would probably use TDM because you can have as many channels as you like. A typical embedded audio product 
will also have um, a microprocessor or a microcontroller as the brains of everything. I won't get into microprocessors too much at the moment because they're quite complex. Microcontrollers in, compas- in comparison are quite simple. They tend to have built-in memory. They're low clock speeds, so they're not particularly powerful, but they are very low power. Um, importantly, they'll be well documented, so uh, they'll be easier to work with, especially if, especially if you're learning or just starting out. If you're working with microcontrollers, it's useful to get yourself a development kit and become acquainted with the manufacturer's supplied reference designs. Make sure the device you're using has the peripherals you need. Peripherals are dedicated hardware to do certain jobs that you need. Uh, for example, if your microcontroller has an I squared S peripheral, you'd use it to collect the audio from the ADC. Data sheets are the documentation for the micro and are written in a very technical manner. Reading them is a skill in itself and will improve with practice. Uh, here's some useful YouTube channels if you want to learn more about electronics and embedded design. EEV blog has tons of videos on electronic programming covering everything, you, probably everything you need. Uh, Martin K. Uh, Schroeder has some pretty intense full board design videos that go through the entire process, I think using KiCad, and I'm sure there's loads more. Uh, the Martin ones are pretty long, but you see the entire thing, the entire process. Uh, before I move on to bare metal microcontroller programming, I was wondering if there's any questions. We looked at analog circuits, schematics, KiCad, ADCs and microcontrollers. Oh, we didn't look at keypad, let's skip that. You may wonder, yeah, let's have a look. Oh, no questions, that's great. That means I explained everything to the fullest extent. Okay, uh, you may wonder why you might need to program bare metal um, or without an OS. Um, Absolutely, you may not need to write bare metal at all. You may well be programming for embedded Linux or a real-time operating system such as FreeRTOS. Either way, it may be useful to know a little bit about the bare metal programming side of things in case you find yourself having to write a very low-level driver. Just as schematics are the language of um, electronics, assembly is the language of microcontrollers. Uh, assembly language is a text representation of the hardware CPU instructions, codes that the CPU understands and are very difficult for a human to understand. Diff- uh, different devices have different dialects of assembly and have specific instructions, so they tend not to be portable. As a minimum, assembly should be used to initialize the system and create what they call the C abstract machine, the minimum required environment to run a C or C++. Uh, application. We need this to get us to the main function, basically. The, uh, the program is amongst you will know as the program entry point. Typically, we're not going to program our entire system in assembly. It's likely that we'll write in a higher level language such as C or C++, possibly even Rust or NIM or uh, whatever. We can do this with some caveats. Uh, microcontrollers have limited memory resources. So we'll likely switch off some of the features that we don't absolutely need. We also don't have the luxury of an operating system, so we'll need to program the hardware directly. You may wonder how exactly we can control the hardware from code. So uh, microcontrollers have special memory locations that are internally connected to hardware. In this example, if we were to save uh, the number five to a, this fictional four bit register, five in binary is 0101, and each binary value is connected to a hardware switch, switching certain hardware facilities on or off or configuring something. Uh, to figure out exactly which memory locations and values you need to write, you'll need to consult the data sheet. So best keep it nearby. We have to cross compile our microcontroller code as the compilers themselves excuse me the compilers themselves can't run on the device uh, for this we can use gcc or clang uh, standard open source compilers build automate automation is something that you'll have to 
probably have to get to grips with, but normally example projects will include this kind of stuff. Um, testing bare metal cross compiled systems can be really tricky. Um, but check out through the switch as they have good strategies, strategies for this. And um, uh, for those of you that saw um, Phil's lightning talk, hopefully you know how important it is to do testing. Um, I said we can't run the compiler directly on a device. Generally, that's true. Though if your target is uh, something like a Raspberry Pi that's got a microprocessor on it that's fairly powerful, you might actually be able to run the compiler on the device. However, chances are it's going to be really slow um, probably too slow to be of much use. Normally, we would cross-compile the code instead. The compiler's natural tendency is to compile for the machine that it's running on, so basically that top-line code, GCC, computer. Um, but given the CPU command line option that's written there, um, it will instead generate an executable that isn't compatible with the development PC at all, but is compatible with the target device, in this case, a microcontroller with an ARM Cortex-M7 CPU. I thought I'd show this in code well. OK. This, you may recognize this code from earlier. Don't worry too much about it. This is that Blinky project that I mentioned. Um, and all that's happening here is that there's a number, and it's getting written into a crazy memory address. If you were to run this on a PC, it would just crash immediately, because this memory address probably doesn't exist. Um, so over here, these instructions are there for a PC, because they're being built by GCC that's prepped up for a PC. This is not going to work on our CPU. Um, but we can give it a try. If I grab that command line option and check it in there, see what happens. It failed. It doesn't know what that is. It has no idea. However, uh, if I go up here to one of the GCCs that's for none, which means no OS, it's going to compile it just fine. And I think if I change this slightly to a different processor, this would probably look a little bit different. Not much different, but enough that it probably, yeah, now it's going to work. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay. Programming and debugging our hardware is also a little tricky. Uh, we've compiled code for our target processor in theory, right? And we can't run it locally, so we have to run it remotely. For those of you used to debugging by like stepping through your code line by line, this will be possible to do via this setup. A debug program such as GDB or LLDB can run the program on the hardware via a hardware debugger. And the hardware debugger interfaces with a program such as OpenOCD, which serves up the hardware to GDB as if it's any other piece of hardware. So essentially, there's a hardware debugger. Um, oh, I've got one here. It looks a bit like this, this sort of thing. And uh, you probably can't see it too well, but there's like pins on here and a USB socket, which plugs into a PC. You would wire those pins. Um, directly to your microcontroller on your board. And OpenOCD talks to the hardware debugger, and it serves up all of that information to GDB, which can talk via OpenOCD to do all the work you need to do. And then effectively, it's like debugging any piece of software. Yeah. Uh, next part. I'm going to take another seat. I hope this isn't too much information. This is just a big brain dump for me, I guess. No questions. Let's continue. Embedded programming. OK, uh, those of you familiar with audio software programming can think of real, uh, can think of hard real time as being one audio thread, uh, one giant audio thread. 
we we have to be a little bit careful about how we uh you know what what we do as we have real time constraints um we've got latency requirements and and we've got you know limited amount of of program memory and ram and we we need to maintain determinism as in um when you switch on the device today you want it to do the same thing as it did yesterday and tomorrow you want it to do the same thing as it did today um interrupts are effectively callbacks triggered by hardware events and signals the tricky part is that a hardware signal may need to be serviced within a certain amount of time for example uh if we received our audio sample from the adc via i squared s we need to save that data to a buffer before the next sample arrives otherwise we could lose that sample um this is what i mean by latency requirements so in this diagram here the hardware is serving up an event to the cpu and the cpu is running its normal program until it gets this event in which case it jumps out um those of you that are into software you'll recognize this as being very similar to um a threading model so it's very much like threading um the regular problem a uh, regular program will jump out service the uh, hardware event and then jump back in and its uh, hardware events tend to be very very high priority and and if the next event comes along before we've finished serving the previous event um or help can break loose so certain features are also typically avoided um for this reason dynamic memory allocation is one such feature it's really useful to be able to conjure um arbitrary amounts of memory on the fly but in an embedded system you may run out of memory which means such allocations may fail it can also be a little too unpredictable so th- and this is kind of what i mean by determinism you want the program to be very predictable as in if you uh were to uh dynamically a- allocate some memory it could take slightly longer um this time around than the last time around because you had to go and free up some memory before you could reallocate it um uh yeah so it can also be a little bit um so it's a problem for like c++ exceptions uh that's another feature that typically gets switched off c++ exceptions are really fast um but they consume quite a lot of memory and rely on dynamic allocations when an exception occurs in this diagram um we've got um our code at the bottom that's basically our program code um some data uh data memory this is this the memory layout in ram and we've got some heap which is where our dynamic uh, di- our dynamically allocated memory is allocated and it grows upwards towards the stack which is where our kind of static allocated memory is i.e. when you call a function it, that's going to that's going to jump down on the stack um i think i answered that one um so weird things happen when you run out of memory which is entirely possible in an embedded system uh your program will probably crash but it might not instead it may just corrupt some other memory being used for something else which may still appear valid and continue running but uh who knows what we'll do but this probably is going to result in weird unexpected behavior this is commonly referred to as undefined behavior excuse me which is something you should avoid wherever possible on a pc running an os you're protected against this kind of thing uh not just because you've got tons of memory uh to use so the os can just give you more when you run out uh but also because there are safeguards put into the memory so that it kind of knows when you've run out um in an embedded device typically you don't ha- you don't have these kind of provisions so you might not even know that you've you've run out of memory when you do um so in this diagram uh the stack is growing downwards heaps growing up but the stack's completely overflowed everything and just wiped over all of the code that we were using hopefully in this scenario it will crash miserably and you can recover um matt asks what is the make of the hardware debugger this is actually um an st stm uh st link tool uh fairly inexpensive debugger and uh, they're pretty common um but you don't have to use if you if you've got a dev kit it's going to have 
this or something like it built into the dev kit. Um, and some dev kits even would allow you to use the debugger that's built into it on other hardware. So you could grab the dev kit, use the debugger that's built into it on a completely different board that you're developing. Um, it's frozen for a lot of people, by the way. Oh, maybe I can get Tom's help with that. Check my messages. Uh, oh, okay. Ah, oh, that sucks. I'm sorry. Um, there's also not much I can do about my connection. Um, should I continue? Uh, yeah, continue. Uh, we can make out what you're saying, but uh, we'll have that in your slides. Oh, okay. Uh, that's not useful. Um, okay, when the system is crashed, what is the state of the CPU? That's a good question. Um, well, essentially what happens when uh, an embedded system like this crashes is that you'll get, hopefully, um, one of the built-in signal handlers. The CPU will have certain hardware interrupts, effectively, that mean the you know, something's gone horribly wrong. In this scenario where you've run out of memory and the stack's corrupted stuff, you may well get some kind of memory exception. It's like a hardware exception. And in your code, you can you can have like a, a, a handler for that exception. But typically what you would do in that scenario is you would force a reset. So you, because um, often in an embedded system, you don't have like a display or some way to um, tell the user that this crash is occurring. So normally you would just reset. I hope that answers the question. Okay, without my slides then, let's see. I was gonna talk about audio programming. Um, I've got, <laughs> got another diagram here, it's not very useful. Um, so I wanted to talk about the audio buffer. And so essentially, if we have an I squared C um, coming in, we've got, we've got our left and right channels coming in by I squared C, and the D, uh, we might have a, um, <clears throat> a direct memory access controller, which is a, a, piece of, a piece of hardware which moves memory around. That's what it's good at. So it might grab our left and right uh, samples and chuck them straight into a buffer. And what you'd effectively have then is an interleave buffer of the left and right samples that are coming in from the I squared X. Um, and you would probably do this because, um, oh yeah, this is popping up saying my internet connection is unstable. Anyway, um, you would probably do it like this and uh, you know buffer up these samples because to service those samples immediately might take too much processing time. It might be a lot more efficient to uh, buffer up all the data that you can and then process them later. Presumably this is the kind of thing that juice plugins do. Um, and this is the same thing that an embedded audio buffer would do as well. Um, once you've got the data, you're free to do whatever you want with it. So we can you know, filter it, apply all sorts of effects um, in much the same way that you would in any audio software application. I, on my screen, I've got Desmos loaded up uh, which some of the, you may know, uh, which is like a, um, it's like an online graphic calculator. Um, not very useful without my slides. Okay, uh, so we've got our data. We've processed it, given it a delay and some amp modeling, whatever you were doing with it. And now what we need to do is get it out of the system. And we we'll, could do this with USB. Our microcontroller may have a USB peripheral, in which case, we can both send and receive audio from a host PC. If you're gonna get into USB, make sure you know a little bit about high speed signaling. Um, USB signals run as a differential pair, um, which is something I'm not gonna explain right now. Um, um, and it runs at high speed. So your PCB layout is quite important. Uh, make use of examples. There are a lot, plenty around on the internet for this and uh, check out um, it's a website called USB in a Nutshell. A uh, really handy online book that explains the inner workings of USB in a clear way. Okay, um, the obvious option 
is to simply output our audio back out to the analog domain. So um, what I've got on the screen right now is an audio codec, not very useful if you can't see it, but still, uh, it's a, uh, yeah. Okay, the audio is getting bad now as well. Yeah, I apologize. My internet connection isn't great out here. All right. Um, so the audio, um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll jump on. Um, I'll be a, a, around online after the talk anyway, so people can catch me on one of the tables after the uh, talk. Um, hopefully by then my internet will have cleared up. But um, we can we can use a codec device instead of our ADC and the DAC. So a, co a codec is effectively an ADC and a uh, digital audio converter. Um, so analog to digital and digital to analog built into one unit, which is pretty handy if you're doing both ways. And this is the kind of thing that would be on your PC motherboard, for example. It's probably got a codec on there for doing you know, the little jack circuits on the back if you have that kind of PC. Um, okay. Uh, I re pretty much reached the end. Um, got my conclusion and my last uh, quote, which no one can read. Uh, okay, so at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned my old USB synth design. Um, it turns out that there's a $50 dev kit that has all of the same hardware on that design. Um, and, and more, it's got a screen and all sorts of extras. This is just one example, um, that I've thrown up on the screen, which is, uh, an STM32 discovery kit. I think it's like a F7 and it's got an audio codec on it. It's got, uh, quite a powerful microprocessor and it's got, um, loads of flash memory and, uh, RAM and an SD card slot, really similar to the design that I was working on. My point being that if you were going to start out, you would, I would recommend that you grab a development kit like this that's already got all the things that you need uh, built into it and working and with examples. Uh, the other point I was going to make is that hardware is pretty difficult and uh, although it's great fun, um, it's it, there, there is a whole other level of uh, grief, uh, you know, beyond what I've described, which is um, designing for manufacture, which gets really, really hairy and can be extremely expensive. Um, you want to be really sure that you need a hardware product if you're going to set out to do, to, uh, on this path. Otherwise, if you can do what you want to do in software, I'd recommend that you do that uh, first, at least. All right, so um, I've reached the end and my internet connection is useless. For which I apologize. How important is testing on real hardware versus simulators? Yeah, um, uh, if you're talking about like um, firmware, then it's, I would say that it's maybe not crazy important that you test on the real hardware. It can be um, quite useful, especially if you have uh, a product that's got lots of different kinds of hardware. Um, and you want to verify that the same code works on, on all of them. But, um, no, I would say testing wise, my preferred method for testing firmware would be to essentially have an abstraction layer, um, below which you've got your hardware only kind of code, um, which would need to be tested on hardware if you're going to test it. And above which you've got code that can actually be run in isolation, um, in a software environment, um, using the same sort of tools that, that you would, uh, test any kind of software. That would be my preferred approach because when you're writing the very low level stuff, like the hardware, it's kind of just, you're testing your interpretation of the documentation effectively. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know how useful that is. Maybe it's useful, but I guess that's up to the preference of whoever's doing it. Are there any more questions? I just wanted to say, um, I don't know if you can hear me, but thank you for everybody that voted for my talk. Um, uh, it's really great to be able to share my knowledge with um, folks like you because I've taken so much from all the talks from ADC over the years. It's really great to give back. Um, any more questions? Otherwise, uh, I'll probably hop over to... Um, uh, 
the uh, maybe table uh, like lobby five, some uh, table over on lobby five, something like that. After after the talk, I was yeah hoping for a few more questions. How much time we got, Tom? Okay, we have to so if there are any more questions. Well, we've got, we've got a few minutes there. Um, but uh, if there are any more questions, um, you know, I think we should probably just. Oh, we've got a raise uh, hand. Let's have no. If you've got a raise hand, then we'll give you a few minutes to type, type into the QA. Yep. Yeah, yeah good, good job uh, persevering. I don't know. If, um it's yeah, kind of really yeah okay. it's kind of distracting and and um a little bit it threw me a little bit because i've kind of got my slides and i've got my notes but i've got to kind of throw it all away because you guys can't see the slides so it doesn't make sense to kind of read what i've got in the notes so um yeah uh winging it a little bit towards the end uh and it's kind of a shame because i spent a lot of time on these diagrams <laughs> Right. Uh, if I wanted to build like a DSP guitar pedal, what would be a good ADC DAC chip to use? Or use that SCM32 discovery kit? Uh, yeah. Um, I personally would grab a discovery kit or some kind of dev kit that's already got an ADC and a DAC on it um, already. Um, because you've already got some hardware that, that works and you know example designs for everything that's on there so it's much more useful to have the dev kit to start off with you can also use the dev kit excuse me as a development environment so even when you do have your custom hardware you can still use the dev kit for uh, some of your development work i hope that answers your question uh, I don't have any particular recommendations for DACs or ADCs. Um, it's been a little while since I've touched that stuff. And the last one that I used was, uh, I mentioned a DAC with a headphone app built into it. Incredibly useful um, in theory, but programming it was an absolute nightmare. So um, I could not recommend that one. Uh, but, but there's a lots of different ones. And it's yeah, it's, if you can find one that's already got really good drivers, that's probably... That's probably um, what you should use. Any ideas on making firmware updates at the customer? Yes, absolutely. Um, the updates are really important because um, you you want to add features later, or um, uh, there's bugs you need to fix. And and yeah, up updating firmware can be can be another tricky one because a lot of devices will have. Um, what they call like a bootloader built into the device. So your kind of vector for updating it will be whatever this built-in bootloader's got. And that's that's probably the probably the best thing to use if it's available. Um, but if that doesn't work for you, um, or if it's not available at all, then building a custom firmware updater, um, it's not trivial, but it's completely possible, and there's plenty of examples out there. Um, uh, I've written a few myself. Uh, let me think. One that I wrote was, uh, for example, um, you would switch the device uh, in a mode and it would appear on the, it was like a USB device, it would appear on the computer as, as if it was a memory card, like a really, really tiny memory card. And you could take your um, update and just drag it onto the memory card in the operating system and that would then update the unit and you could just switch it off and on again and it would be updated. For example, um, another one might be uh, using, I don't know, any kind of vector like MIDI. You could update via MIDI, via anything really. All it takes is that you would have a kind of separate program on the device that you would call a bootloader. And when the bootloader runs, you it can do nothing but receive a new update uh update the system and yeah i i hope that answers the question um over the air updates are yeah really handy 